Welcome to our online friends and colleagues. Uh, Can we speak here as well? Yeah. yeah. Stop chatting. We might. Yeah. Thank you. Is it possible for the online people to speak here also? Maybe we could test that. Does somebody online want to speak? Hello. This is from online. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, we can hear you loud and clear. Wonderful. Thank you. Right. So with a, with a great pleasure, I, I introduce the next speaker, Mark Sarok. He will be speaking about something on the whole of yeah. cancer, but he yes. will be more specific about the mathematical uh, method sorry. and GMT <laughs> uh, dynamics in glioblastoma. Yes, thank you so much. Mark, thank you very much for yeah, coming. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for the welcome. So I, I think Thomas just wanted to remind you all of this beautiful figure that we all know so well, and Thomas did a very good job of elucidating in the previous talk. So I'm actually going to speak mainly about kind of this one over here. I think, anyway, maybe somebody, I said there's a few, when we were around number 11, 12, I was thinking some of those might actually also be appropriate for my talk. So, um, and this kind of distinction between epigenetic and phenotypic stuff, that's, that's the kind of stuff I want to speak about. Um, so yeah, is that does, does anybody want to say anything more about this slide or should we yeah move move on? Apologies, yeah. I'll just be running back and forth. Uh yeah. So hopefully that's the last time I have to go to that computer. <laughs> um so yeah. I'm from the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. Um got this fancy crest and it's uh, kind of very old medical school in Ireland uh, recently got university status. It's kind of primarily focused on medicine and health sciences. And it's based in Dublin in Ireland. And okay, this is a little bit different looking, but Dublin is very different from Toronto in some ways. I think it's quite a striking difference. Can you guess which city has a height restriction on new build uh, new buildings? <laughs> It's this one over here. <laughs> and um, that leads Dublin to being a very diffuse and spread out city. It's kind of got tendrils that reach out into the nearby counties, and it's always kind of expanding outwards. Much like Blue Bastoma. Yeah. The GTA is great. Yeah. Greater Toronto area. That's, yeah, I was thinking that. People were telling me that when I landed in Toronto that actually this is a facade. It's not all like this. It's kind of, it actually spreads out. I also like glioblastoma. Sorry, that was my segue that I was trying to make. <laughs> I'm seeing the airplane, you know, coming over and I was thinking, how do I kind of just do a cold open here? But um, yeah, so glioblastoma is an aggressive type of brain cancer. I don't have to spend too long on this. It's highly invasive in nature. It's difficult to completely remove surgically. It's often resistant to treatment. What is that treatment? Well, currently it's the Stoop protocol, which is mass maximal safe surgical resection followed by radiotherapy, and it's given in conjunction with temozolomide, or what I would call TMZ. And I think right away I'm going to get into trouble for that. So I apologize if I call it TMZ and everyone else calls it TMZ. I'm going to try my best to say TMZ because I think we're in North America, although some a Canadian can correct me. Would a Canadian say Z or Z? Z, okay, then, uh, it's apologies. Like yeah. I said, we're influenced by Americans. So yes, you were telling me. Right, okay. But it is Z. Right. So I'm confused now, yeah. <laughs> but you would say when you were trying to bring up in Canada, you'd say X, Y, Z. If you cross the border, you'd say X, Y, Z. Okay. But because of the, you know, huge influence of American culture and medicine, we're all going to say TMZ, and I'm going to say TMZ in this talk. Um, so we can see that with this Stoop protocol, oh, I've forgotten how to use this. Ah, it's, it's not quite coming out as clearly as I'd hoped, but this is a kind of Kaplan-Meier curve showing the survival uh, percentage over time of glioblastoma patients. And you can see essentially with the TMZ the patients fare a bit better, but in general, it's still quite poor. It's still only about 12 to 15 months with this standard treatment. And apologies, I wonder if I can just get rid of that. Um, 
okay, no, no, no I'm not going to be able to get rid of that. That's okay. <laughs> uh, I don't want to accidentally ruin the time. But yeah, so five year survival rate. Who can? <laughs> I think it's six percent, and I apologize if I got that number wrong. But the five year survival rate. The main thing I want to say is not very good. It's it's poor, and there is this um, influence of the methylation status of the MGMT promoter, which seems to have a big um, influence on the survival percentage or overall survival time of the patients. And this was my, I was going to include some side on the hallmarks of cancer. I forgot that Thomas was before me and he's going to, he's all, already given a much better job than I could ever do at going through them all. But I just want to say, I'm going to focus on resisting cell death. Um, and Thomas already spoke about the fact that it's another slip over this quite quickly. It's a key mechanism in cancer progression and treatment resistance. It can be due to the evasion of apoptosis, altered DNA repair mechanisms, overexpression of survival proteins. And our focus in this talk is MGMT mediated resistance in glioblastoma. So, MGMT, what is it? Some of you might not be familiar with it. It's a DNA repair protein, sometimes referred to as a suicide enzyme. So, in doing its business of repairing the protein, it gets kind of consumed or used up. So, it's kind of an interesting feature that I want to make clear from the beginning. Um, it removes the alkyl groups specifically from the O6 position of guanine. It effectively counteracts the effects of the temozolomide treatment. Um, so it repairs the DNA damage caused by TMZ, sorry, if I already said TMZ, reducing its effectiveness. And we can see here if we have high MGMT methylation, so the methylation epigenetic modification essentially gets in the way of the normal transcriptional process. So if we have high MGMT methylation, that's associated with low expression of the MGMT gene. And we can see that when we have this high MGMT methylation, the patients on the blue line here survive quite a bit better. And this is actually the MGMT status of the glioblastoma is both prognostic and predictive of the overall survival. So the status of MGMT is crucial at the moment. It's one of the very few things when we get a glioblastoma patient in, check the MGMT status of the glioblastoma, straight away we have a pretty good idea of how long they're going to live just based on that MGMT status. Um, so there's also this, so I've tried to, sorry, go on, Thomas. Uh, who produces MGMT? So who produces it? Yeah. All of our cells produce MGMT. Yeah. Normal cells and cancer cells. Sorry, that's a very good point. Both the normal cells and the cancer cells produce MGMT. And where it gets confusing in the literature is the link between TMZ treatment and MGMT expression. Some papers show that there's an increase in MGMT expression following TMZ treatment, both at the mRNA and protein level. Well, that's something I'll come back to, but just to keep in the back of your mind for now. Sorry. So Please. you're saying, though, that the, um, the uh, increase in expression occurs in cancer cells before the initiation of treatment, as you said, when the patient shows. Right. Uh, percent. So it's actually, it's following. Uh, so after... We've treated the patients with the standard treatment. No, that I understand. Ah, sorry. But you also said that patients present, that you could predict based on how they present in terms of, but when they right. present, they don't. Sorry, that's true. Yeah, yeah. The way I read it, that was not quite right. You're right. It's it's kind of, we're always kind of following the treatment. Uh, yeah, we don't. Um, that's, a, that's a very good uh, point, though, yeah. Yeah, so, and also, is it a, so, so just also to understand, is this a genetic change in, in it, or some sort of genetic change. Yeah, that's the whole point. Yeah, that's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, yeah, it's a very good question, though. And that's, I don't want to oh, okay. answer that quite yet. Yeah. yeah. And also, sorry, one last. Uh, no, no, that's good. Uh, does it have relations to P53? P53. So that's not something I've studied. It, it may well do. You know, um, I'm taking a kind of very simplistic, parsimonious uh, oh, okay. approach here, but interactions with P53 may well be very important. And uh, that, that's one way that, yeah, please, sorry. <laughs> um, so 
in the last point when you say some papers show the increase, is that in vitro or in vivo? So yeah, that's in vitro and I think and in vitro in mice. And there's nice data in patients and um, yeah, the data is a little bit sparse when it comes to the MGMT expression. And I think this has led to these kind of, well, what I'll say is a bit of confusion in the literature over this, but anyway, I'll, I'll come back to that a little bit. Anyway, I want to um, outline my talk, so I'm gonna present models of cell death resistance, focusing on non-genetic aspects. What I mean that is more like phenotype or things related to mRNA and protein and gene expression rather than mutations in genes. I'm going to talk about this thing, phenotypic selection. I'm going to present some minimal models to capture phenotypic selection that I first developed when trying to capture antibiotic resistance in bacteria. And when I was making this talk, I thought that bit is completely unrelated to the hallmarks of cancer. But when Thomas was speaking this morning, um, you know, about this bacteria and all this stuff, that, that stuff might not be so, you know, rash field after all. It might actually be tangentially more related than I thought. Um, so I'm going to present these kind of minimal models, and then the way I tend to make models is kind of what I would have thought of was like a bottom-up, so kind of a start off as simple as possible and gradually build in complexity with the availability of data. So that's my philosophy. That's the way uh, I tend to do things, but I know there's going to be contrasting opinions on that. And, um, you know, it, I understand that holistic approaches are needed as well. So um, anyway, I'm going to suggest, I'm going to end by suggesting some treatment strategy based on the model output. So phenotypic selection, it's also got this uh, name as um, emergent gene expression. It's sometimes called non-Darwinian evolution, so that's to uh, distinguish it from Darwinian evolution. So what it is, it's expression of a fitness-inducing gene which is selectively upregulated in response to a change of environment. And it, it was funny because this morning when we were discussing, I think there was already a discussion about this uh, between, uh, I think, Paul and Edward. Um, you're talking about the time scales at which a highly expressed protein and it might uh, this is essentially what I'm going to be speaking about, but um, it was just interesting to hear that it's um, discussed already. So this is what I mean by phenotypic selection. So fitness is based on phenotype rather than genotype, and this has implications for cancer drug resistance and antibiotic resistance. So here's the kind of classical uh, image of, let's say, Darwinian evolution or genetic selection, where we have a homogeneous population of cells, um, with maybe one genetic mutant, which in response to the addition of a cytotoxic drug survives, whereas all the other cells are killed off, this cell that's kind of been selected for can then divide and replicate. And then when we apply that same drug again, we find it's totally ineffective. The population is now resistant, if you like. So that, that's kind of the classical view of things that I think we're all familiar with and we don't need to spend much time on. So the other half of it is this non-genetic heterogeneity with phenotypically resistant subpopulation fractions. So here we have expression of a fitness-inducing gene that's expressed in cells stochastically at different levels. And let's say that the cells with a higher expression of this gene tend to be fitter and can survive in response to the addition of a cytotoxic drug. So here, when we add the cytotoxic drug, maybe, you know, 90% of the cells are killed off, but we have a few cells that are able to survive based on their expression of a fitness-inducing protein at that time. These cells are then able to divide, and what the thought is, is that this then gives the chance for more hardwired genetic mutations to arise. So this phenotypic selection may precede genetic selection. So it's kind of a temporary measure that allows these cancer cells to develop really dangerous mutations that we can't then treat as easily. And as Thomas was saying earlier, this, uh, you know, these mutations can really accumulate quickly and it can become very difficult. So Ideally, we would have, I guess, loved for the 
initial phenotypic selection to be not there and all the cells be wiped out. So what I'm interested in is how how do you overcome this phenotypic selection? Sorry. Sorry. So, so a lot of experiments show nowadays that you stop treatment and you get some reversibility to the original population. Right? I'm gonna yeah, I'm gonna speak about that. And and yeah, that's an excellent question though. Yeah. Um so yeah, what I just want to Put some really basic requirements of the model to, to model the phenotypic selection. So the model should be stochastic, stochastic to capture variability in phenotypes, and it should include cell growth division and cell death to capture selection. Um, so the first ingredient is stochastic gene expression. So we might use kind of chemical master equation with a simple uh, gene expression model like we see in the top right there. And I think such models, you know, there's been quite a lot of progress analytically. They almost have Full analytical solutions at this case, at least in terms of the first and second moments. Um, but I'm for this talk going to use more computational and numerical approaches. So here we see kind of a pseudocode of the uh, stochastic simulation algorithm where we sample the next time, the time to the next reaction from an exponential distribution, and then we sample two additional random variables to work out uh, probab probabilistically the next reaction that occurs. And we end up with some plots like. This where individual trajectories um, are statistically exact solutions of the underlying chemical master equation. So we might even just at this point say, so if at time 100 we were to add some drug and we can see that some cells have very high protein expression here, others have very low. So we'd expect maybe these cells up here to survive at that moment in time. And I want to link this in with cell growth models so here I'm just showing basic kind of exponential growing populations, but I'm modeling it in a few different ways. The first way is this kind of mother machine approach, which is nice for modeling cell lineages. And here we just model a mother cell growing and then it produces a daughter cell. We discard the daughter cell and keep the mother cell. And then we look at lineages going forward like this. And there might be some variability in the final volume of the cell. So it might not exactly double before we have the division. And there might be one daughter cell slightly larger than the other. So these kinds of variability are, are built in here. And I've included some pseudocode for that in the top right corner. Um, of course, this mother machine approach is... Please. Just, uh, Sorry. Can I ask a question regarding previous slide? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, any idea uh, about uh, like type of parts? Like, uh, so, you uh, try like a uh, diffusion process model. Like, oh, like uh, a diffusion process to model the stochastic gene expression. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a master. Yeah, it's a chemical. It's a, it's a, right. Okay. That's what it's doing. Right, yeah, yeah, and that that is a that's an interesting point. Yeah, there are, I guess, different levels of fidelity that we can model in, in chemical Langevin equations, or what I use at some point is a kind of tall leaping algorithm that's somewhere between a stochastic differential equation and the stochastic simulation. It's a little bit of a crude approximation, but those kind of things are very important considerations. And a big point that I want to get across in this talk is that ultimately I was trying to balance between fitting. Well, let's say capturing data while keeping the model as computationally tractable as possible. And so there were some, I don't want to say shortcuts, but some approximations were made that could be refined. Um, and I, I'll hopefully touch upon them. But with respect to this kind of modeling of the cell growth, so I have this kind of mother machine approach, and we have this exponentially growing population approach, but this. I hope to convince you that this middle, um, let's say, approach can quickly become computationally intractable, especially with this exponentially growing population. And can, while of course that's what happens in nature, it, it's just, it prohibits certain things. And um, what we found is a good middle path between the mother machine and the exponential growing population is uh, fixed population. So something like a thousand, ten thousand, hundred thousand cells. 
And when the cells grow and divide, we kind of randomly replace a cell in our population. And I know there are problems with that as well, but this was kind of a what we felt was a good middle ground. So the exponential growing um, approach, obviously, is the most realistic for unrestricted growth. It's very computationally expensive. And if we're trying to compare populations at different time points or compare two different populations with the stochasticity involved in the cell doubling time and things like this, it can become a little bit tricky for comparing two populations in a fair way. Uh, the, the mother machine approach obviously is good for studying individual cell lineages, but it misses these population level dynamics and population snapshots. Whereas the fixed population, I believe, or I'm trying to convince you, balances computational efficiency of population insights, allows fair comparisons easily between conditions, captures this population heterogeneity, and uh, doesn't rule out simulation based inference, which is ultimately what I'm working towards. Um, so yes, yeah, so I think you probably got the picture already, but it's something like this. So we have the population at time t, at time t plus tau, there might be three cells that divide. We then take these cells and then randomly replace existing cells in the population to keep the um, population constant. And I just made a note here, I should have attributed the author of the paper, but there was some interesting study that showed the uh, Mother machine approach can lead to significantly, uh, I wish that wasn't there, underestimation of, I think, the mean number of molecules or overestimation of the mean number of molecules and underestimation of the intrinsic noise. So there's some issue with using this kind of mother machine individual, um, you know, mother cell being replaced by one of its daughters. And we're not going to use that approach. I think often I do this. Yeah. When we track daughter cells, right. Not getting things that are so I know the author is Philip Thomas of Imperial Philip Thomas of Imperial College London. I apologize for not including that reference. And I'm going to yeah. I don't know if we have maybe the slides somewhere online. I want to make sure I yeah. So yeah. So. No, yeah, oh, well, that's true, actually. Yeah, that would be in terms of, yeah, exactly, exponentially. Oh, yeah, exactly, based on the stochastic simulation algorithm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, where are you? Yeah, so I want to combine these two, which is actually the point that you were just raising there. So we want to kind of combine the stochastic simulation algorithm with the analytical solutions of some cell growth models. And yeah, as I've said already, we use tall leaping uh, coupled with the analytical solution of cell growth models. Initially, just exponential growth models. We also use analytical so solutions of logistic growth model, comparison growth as well. And we use binomial partitioning to split mRNAs and proteins between daughter cells. And I've, yeah, I'm probably not going to go through all of the pseudocode here, but this is the kind of output you get where you have, this is just a single cell. This is actually a mother cell simulation just to show you very easily what I'm talking about. So we have kind of the cells growing uh, and and then halving in volume as, as they divide with the mother cell uh, replacing uh, one of the daughter cells being discarded. And we have the mRNA levels kind of going up and down. And, and we see in response to the cell dilution a, a strict uh, approximate halving of the mRNA. And similarly with the protein, and here I have the kind of number of cells tracked on the bottom here. And we can then, okay, okay, before I do that, I did the exact same thing again, but this time I divided by the volume of the cell. I think this is what I'm going to be using throughout the talk, so I just wanted to make that explicit. So we tend to look at the protein per cell volume and mRNA per cell volume. Um, and the number of cells is just the same here. And now I've added in 10 cells. So now we're in this fixed cell population approach that I was mentioning earlier. And we can see the kind of dynamics of the cells growing and dividing alongside the mRNA and protein concentrations. Excuse me. 
So this is just an um, exponentially growing cell. So it's just an exponential cell growth model. Deterministic, sorry. It's purely deterministic, the cell growth. Uh, sorry, uh, or maybe I have some stochasticity in terms of the final cell volume. So based on, it, it's it's kind of this um, noisy linear map that maps of, basically adds a little bit of noise around the threshold. Yeah, exactly. There's a little bit of noise in there. And also when the cells half, they, they don't exactly half in size. There's, it's not like 50-50 because there's some experiments to show that the cells, you know, one daughter cell can be slightly larger than the other. And so we've tried to reflect that as well. So there is a little bit of stochastic as well. I apologize, yeah. But, I have yeah. a question. This question is ah. the stochastic process. Yeah, yeah. Between from the standpoint, yeah. you quite a little bit of noise. Right, right. Yeah, this is just some uniform, yeah, uniform sampled noise, sorry. A sampled from a uniform distribution over some range. Yeah. So yeah, the initial experimental data that motivated all of this was a bacterial system, as I've said before. So specifically, we're interested in um, HIS-C, which maybe nobody is familiar with. I, I don't think it's so widely known. So it's an enzyme which plays a crucial role in the creation of histidine, a, a basic amino acid. And histidine is needed for cell growth. So cells that have more histidine tend to grow faster. And if we have high expression of HIS-C, we confer fitness upon the cell population in a histidine-depleted environment. So if initially we have the cells in a medium that's rich in histidine, they're all growing very nicely. If we then deplete the environment of histidine, only those cells that have high expression of the HIS-C gene will then continue to grow nicely. The ones that happen to have low expression of the HIS-C gene will no longer grow as nicely. And yeah, so we have some data actually related to this. So they tagged HIS-C with some fluorescence protein. And what they found is that in response to a change of the environment, the HIS-C distribution, HIS-C protein, if you like, shifted to the right. Um, now, they also had a very tight control because it's not that interesting to have the expression of a protein increase or shift to the right. This can often happen if cells are just growing a little bit more slowly. There could be less dilution and the cells can shift to the right. So they also had a kind of... Um, a reference protein, if you like, that was also expressed in those same cells. And what we found is, or sorry, what they found is that when they depleted the environment of histidine, they see a modest uh, shift to the right in these reference proteins. These reference proteins do not confer fitness. Um, but when we looked at the ratio of the fitness proteins to the reference proteins, we see a a stark shift to the right, a unimodal shift to the right in the distribution. An interesting thing, which I think, Edward, you commented on earlier, is is this process reversible or not? And I apologize, that's a little bit obscure there, but it's uh, if you add histidine, the system then returns to its initial state. This is an interesting part about it. So the idea is that we're more in, in this kind of monostable structure that we see in the right, as opposed to a more sophisticated, interesting dynamical landscape, which might have multiple kind of fit states. So in this kind of regime, we might expect that if we move from an unfit to a fit state and then we, and then add back the histidine, we might expect the cells to stay in this higher mode of expression. But what they found is that, it, yeah, it's more like this scenario here where it kind of goes back to its initial state. Yeah, so we were trying to model this in a simple way where we had this kind of approximate model I was talking about before with the expression of two genes. Uh, the only difference being that one um, influences the level of the internal histidine so that when we remove the external histidine, the cells that have more of this protein will have an advantage. And what we found... 
Uh, yeah, uh, this uh, well, I just have to keep an eye on the time. Yeah, what we found is that it, just to wrap up, this was uh, quite a few years of work. But what we eventually found is that it was easy to observe an increase in his and model simulations following his depletion, but these were usually for superficial reasons, like um, as I was mentioning earlier, just the growth rate decreasing and uh, the level of dilution diminishing and an accumulation of his seed. But it was very difficult for us to observe any increase relative to a reference protein. So when we were do doing this kind of model, we were using the exact same parameters for transcription and translation for the reference protein and the, and the fitness protein. And just to summarize what we found is that we, we essentially needed the autocorrelation time or the lifetime of his seed or the fitness protein, I apologize, I've forgotten to end that sentence there, um, fitness inducing protein to extend beyond that of the cell so that dilution doesn't wipe out any selection. So we need a kind of a positive feedback here to kind of keep a memory of the uh, higher protein expression. And around this time, um, when we were doing these models, it was quite a few years ago now, as you see from the years on these papers, I think it's 2015-16, um, there started to be a growing consensus that global positive feedbacks exist between the growth rate and gene expression rates. So it's more like this kind of picture, particularly in bacteria, where the cell growth rate would then impact in the same manner both the reference protein and the fitness protein. And essentially, with these extra positive feedback groups, we could start to see this unimodal shift to the right in our simulations of our model. And we actually did a huge uh, approximate Bayesian computation model comparison study where we looked at basically trying to look at the minimal models with different ingredients and trying to figure out which ones gave us this kind of uh, ratio greater than one. And there's only three models that really came out and they all involved these global gene expression growth rate uh, feedback groups. Yes. Apart from one that was on the right, yeah, which was, it didn't quite capture our data that we had that we were trying to model. It was like a, it was a model that had a, what we called regulated gene expression. So constitutive gene expression is just kind of constant uh, expression of a gene into mRNA. What we're terming regulated gene expression is when we have a kind of switching of a gene on and off. So there, there's kind of this rapid on and off switching that can capture this kind of bursty behavior of gene expression. So it does not regulated by prescription factor. That's simply adding a yeah. binary variable. It's just a binary variable that can randomly, yeah, exactly. And when we kind of observed this bimodal distribution started to emerge in, in this model. So we did actually get this uh, ratio increasing, but when we looked at the kind of simulation output, output, it would be kind of like switching between one mode and the other. There would be a kind of bimodal distribution in the protein. And before we depleted the histidine, they would be roughly the same. And after, the kind of higher mode would be selected. So it was kind of, it's a little bit of a different thing to what we were investigating, but yeah, we kind of included it here in the table. To ask technical uh -huh. yeah. So when you speak about uh, many models to by model, yeah. Because three minutes ago, actually, I put in the face generation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, if you can go backwards, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It could be related. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. More. yeah. yeah. Right. Ah, I see, see, yeah. In data, right? And the left most diagram is the yeah. for, uh, like I understand, it's a reference level one, yeah? Yeah. The horizontal, the horizontal uh, axis. So, yeah. uh, what you have is it's linear, what you call uh, Laplace or double exponential distribution. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Then when you uh, move away from it, you get a kind of uh, curve approximated mm -hmm. by norm. Yeah, so right. here, so I should say, uh, double exponential Laplace distribution is actually useful in uh, 
Uh, statistical evidence for big data because yes, yes, this is absolute value to certificate right? Can we get a kind of uh, transition phase transition from uh Laplace to double exponential level one to normal, right? Would this school machine, uh, that, that, yeah, that phenomenon be because I I work on that. It sounds very interesting. Uh, you know, uh, off the top of my head now, I'm not sure. But I think we might have to discuss more in person later. Uh, it sounds like it could be another possible explanation of the day. Right. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to ask a question. Right. Sorry, yeah. Yep, please. So, so, Sorry, uh, yeah. So, uh, uh, the, what kind of mechanism accounts for this feedback? Uh, with growth, I'm sorry, I, I didn't expression. I'm sorry, I got a very right. Yeah, it's yeah, the exact mechanism what's driving these global yeah. feedbacks. Yeah, that, that's a very good question. Uh, you know, I think our understanding at the moment is more just that, um, basically measuring the growth rates, uh, under these and the gene expression levels. Um, and it's kind of like, uh, I guess a top down understanding of it but i understand what you're saying is like mechanistically what's causing these links between the growth rate and the gene expression level and um you know i, I don't think that's very clear yet but I, I might be mistaken but i think that's that's a very good question um i wish i could answer it better uh, competition for uh housekeeping uh, right I, yes at the right of Mm -hmm. But I don't know if that's what's happening here. It may be, yeah. I think there were some studies looking into those. Yeah, this um, Karen Swag group, which I might have. It's interesting, Russ. Yeah. So... Yeah, I think exactly. Sorry, yeah. So I didn't build these kind of features into my model, but it, you know, it's, it's kind of... I kind of just yeah put it in more as a phenomenological term. But it's a very good question, you know, like if I was really going from the ground up, I would be interested in including these details and, and I haven't. Um, uh, really, because I, I think, it, I guess it depends what question they're trying to answer and things, but I apologize, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a very good question. I wish I could answer it there. Um, yeah, oh, sorry, I can't remember where it was, but essentially, you know, in the end, we were trying to, uh, infer some data with these models and we found this kind of dose dependent effect so we would have this uh, i saw apologize about the colors especially colorblind viewers but essentially we found that the, the larger doses of the histidine we supplied um oh sorry it's a reversing so the, we would get the maximum effect with zero histidine supplied and then as we added more the um level of the fitness protein relative to the reference protein would diminish. So it was kind of um, a dose dependent effect. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Um, and, and it would also be reflected in these kind of OD curves or, or the cell growth levels would be impacted and we were able to capture these reasonably well, obviously not exactly, but um, at least qualitatively with our, with our models. Uh, and anyway, just to wrap up those lessons, because I, I feel like I'm running out of time. So the lessons learned from bacteria, uh, phenotypic selection requires sufficient noise and gene expression. I don't think I even uh, emphasize that enough, but the mRNA noise in particular had to be sufficient to kind of drive this phenotypic selection. And we needed some kind of cellular memory, which we found with the addition of the global positive feedback loops uh, we could account for. And then we would observe this dose dependent selective upregulation of hit proteins observed in, in response to various stresses. I've already showed you this histidine, his C example, which is very obscure, but we were looking at more kind of common antibiotic uh, drugs and, and things like this as well. And if anyone's interested, I'm more than happy to share some more literature on that. Um, but yeah, but I think the key point I also want to drive home, if I haven't already, is this may provide a temporary survival strategy before genetic adaptation. Uh, and in bacterial populations, it's potentially widespread. We find essentially huge parts of the parameter space that could explain our data. So it wasn't um, 
or how to, it wasn't like a very stiff part of the parameter space where parameters had to be in some very tight conformation to observe the uh, behavior, but it, it was quite a easy um, data to capture with the model. Anyway, yeah, so I tried to take some of these lessons from uh, bacteria, I apologize if I'm going over time, um, to MGMT modeling and glioblastoma. And we tried to keep the models as similar as possible, but we would uh, use comparency and so analytical solutions of comparison and growth rates. We would use growth rates parameters as close as we could to the literature for the growth rate rates of glioblastoma cells and the, the sizes of glioblastoma cells and all these different details as best we could. And we also had this additional interesting fact that when the NGMT protein would um, repair DNA damage, we would have it kind of consumed in a kind of chemical reaction. And we had to also, I haven't actually talked or included cell death at all in any of the models so far, which is of course a crucial component as well. So I'm just gonna quickly, uh, so we have yeah, the same models as before, and now, just to show the rough idea, I've included just a basic threshold model. So if the protein levels are below a certain level at time 50, I've said the cell dies. And even with just this basic model, so it's the same thing I was talking about before with the self growth, cell growth division, the mRNA dynamics, protein dynamics. Um, we start to see when we add, and this fixed cell population, over here, we have 10 cells, and we could start to see this kind of selection of the higher protein expression states, even with this very simple toy model that I'm showing here. And the interesting thing also that we observed is that we get this kind of cell population or cell viability, I'm going to call recovery over time. So initially, when this kind of threshold models applied, you see a huge drop in the cell population with all those cells that don't have enough of this protein being killed. And then we start to see a recovery in the cell population. And if we look at that, just with 100 cells, we do a kernel density estimate of 100 cells. It doesn't look too pretty, but we see a kind of shifting to the right in the distribution. But this is all very rough toy modeling, and there's no reference protein here. There's no probabilistic cell death here. It's just a threshold. Um, there's no dose dosing of TMZ. It's just a constant uh, cell death. So we, we try to do all these things more carefully and then use approximate Bayesian computations. Specifically, we use this adaptive APMC, adaptive population Monte Carlo variant, which we found to be a bit more efficient. And we were trying to spend as much time as we could carefully crafting these prior distributions to be consistent with the literature on real blastoma and MGMT dynamics. And we defined loss functions to capture available experimental data. We did have a little bit of in-house experimental data in RCSI, essentially the cell viability of MGMT expressing GBM cells under different doses of TMZ and different growth rates. And we aim to identify parameter sets that produce phenotypic selection of MGMT in response to TMZ. Sorry, I'm going too quickly. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Do you have a, first of all, how many parameters? Second, you said one of these fixed population models? With, yes. What, what uh, excuse me. Yeah, I was, I was starting to get worried that I was going to run out of time, so I went a bit in overdrive there. Apologies <laughs> <laughs> about that. Thank you for stopping me. So the, the model is still relatively simple. I wish I had. I don't have sort of the same, the same. Yeah, I don't have it anywhere, right? I thought six, seven parameters or something. Yeah, it's just six or seven parameters or something. It's relatively small model, very parsimonious, very simplistic model. Maybe sorry, I'm being it might be eight or nine parameters. Yeah. And what was your other question? It's a fixed population model. Yeah, it's still with like a thousand. Yeah, of ten thousand maybe cells we were using or a hundred thousand, I can't remember. It was it basically as much as we could computationally handle. Yeah. So when you do parameter yeah. the average the Yeah, I think we were, yeah, exactly. So the cell viability, so we were fitting to things like that. And there we would, like we have that exact same data essentially from this simulations. But in terms of, that's the unfortunate thing about this is we didn't have data for gene expression. So we didn't have the same 
we had these really cool experiments with the bacteria with this TCAM machine that would simultaneously give you for the essence outputs for uh, I think up to three genes and give you some cell growth uh, dynamics at the same time. And I suppose that's the advantage of working with bacteria. There are this, these kind of technologies available that are, give you beautiful data that you can put very rigorously, lots of different uh, bits of output from the model. But we were essentially just looking at, okay, keeping the cell viability and the cell growth and things like that as closely constrained to data that we had. But we were just exploring what parts of the parameter space would give us this selective upregulation of MGMT. But we didn't constrain it to data. So that's a weakness of the study is that we didn't have the MGMT expression to, to add. So we didn't, as you were saying, take the mean of the MGMT or, or something like that because we, we just didn't have it. We looked at we essentially defined a loss term that would give us the shift to the right in the distribution of MGMT. Uh, but that was kind of... Um, so, so it's sort of a threshold thing? I mean, yeah, like, yeah. Good and yeah, we were just trying to identify parameter sets that would... Yeah, exactly. It's very good questions. So, yeah, and um, essentially, yeah, we found that it was uh, relatively easy with this simple model to get the selective upregulation of MGMT in response to TMZ. And again, we found that kind of similar to the, oh yes, I, I kind of going too fast there. Um, with the bacteria models, we had to have these kind of positive feedback loops between the cell growth and the gene expression. But with the, um, but with the uh, MGMT models with the cell death included, we found that it wasn't necessary actually to include these positive feedback loops, which we found that was kind of an interesting uh, difference. Um, but we also looked at um, essentially varying the noise. We would kind of start from a parameter set that would give us this selective upregulation of MGMT in response to the reference protein. And then we would look at varying the MGMT mRNA noise levels. And we would kind of very two parameters. So we've defined the noise in terms of the coefficient of variation squared. And because this is a kind of constitutive gene expression model, it's essentially a birth death model. So it's a kind of Poisson process. And, you know, we can write down analytical uh, terms for the mean level of mRNA. And we could essentially then vary by decreasing B1, we would increase the level of mRNA noise. And we would then vary uh, B2, which is the translation rate of the protein, and we kind of... Yeah, of yes, a birth death process. Yeah, exactly. So we vary B1 and B2 to match the protein levels while varying the mRNA noise levels. And, and essentially, we found that as we increase the mRNA noise, we get this kind of nice increase in the level of what we call definitive selection or the mean level of MGMT to a reference protein. Sorry, but the protein is not a Poisson process, so um, the mRNA is... Right, right, true, true. Well, but it doesn't work well. The protein is not a Poisson process. Oh, yeah, okay. Because of the parameter. Anyway, we looked at bringing the mRNA noise and the skewness, and we found that, that these tend to influence the level of this phenotypic selection. And this is just a quick look at the... Uh, posterior distributions from the ABC study. These were the kind of parameter sets that gave us the selective upregulation of MGMT. And one of the key things that we found was that essentially the translation rate had to be high. It was always hugging the right hand side, of, no matter what prior distribution we used, it would tend to hug the right hand side. And uh, I think it was a low transcription rate and high translation rate were two of the key things that came out from our study. Um, so this was kind of a basic MGMT model that I want to summarize briefly. We, we found that cell death resistance in GBM could be driven by MGMT without any need for genetic alterations. Selective dose-dependent increase of MGMT was observed in response to TMZ. And we found that sufficient noise and schema seemed to be needed. And also this high translation rate from the approximate Bayesian computation study seemed to be uh, necessary too. And I'm once again repeating that point uh, about the temporary survival strategy before genetic adaptation. 
And then finally, I wanted to say that the major omission from this model is the methylation status of the MGMT promoter, which I started with saying was the most important thing. So uh, now we have like 10 minutes left. But anyway, so clinical studies, um, oh yeah, on, on this um, MGMT promoter methylation status, one of the interesting things was a study around uh, quite recently, 2020, I believe, I apologize, I didn't include the year, but there's a reference at the bottom there, if you can see it. Um, what they found is that there was a downward shift in the MGMT promoter methylation percentage from primary to recurrent GBM tumors following TMZ treatment. So essentially, they had these cell line studies where they would show that as the concentration of TMZ increased, the percentage of MGMT uh, positive cells would increase and MGMT positive cells being unmethylated cells. So uh, there's a shift from methylated to unmethylated MGMT cells. Um, and, and they would also find the average proportion of live cells, uh, which was handy data for us to include in the model as, as I'll say there, the average proportion of live cells in response to TMZ treatment. And we essentially, Change the basic model here to then include different uh, MGMT promoter methylation states, which upon cell division would probabilistically switch to the other promoter methylation states. And for simplicity, we only included three promoter methylation states. So unmethylated, hemimethylated, and fully methylated MGMT promoters. And the main assumption we had in our trials is that the transcription rate B1 would essentially be highest for the unmethylated MGMT promoter and lowest, uh, lowest for the fully methylated MGMT promoter. And with this addition of the promoter methylation status in this basic model, which had, we're still using the fixed cell population, it has about 10, 12 parameters. It's still a very parsimonious, simple model. We found that the phenotypic selection of MGMT could occur independently of, meth of the methylation downshift. So that was something interesting we found is that the percentage of unmethylated cells could stay almost constant. I think it was a small increase, but we could see uh, increase in the mean MGMT level relative to the reference protein. We also found that we could observe the promoter methylation downshift, so the switch from methylated to unmethylated MGMT promoters uh, independently of a phenotypic selection, we can actually see almost reverse phenotypic selection where the MGMT levels are actually lower relative to the reference protein in, in some regions of the parameter space. And I think we understood this based on the fact that the MGMT protein would be consumed in its act of repairing the DNA, DNA damage. And finally, we found that we could observe MGMT promoter methylation downshift at the same time as the phenotypic selection of MGMT in other regions of the parameter space. So essentially the model was very rich and we had these kind of three different loss terms that we used to capture these three very different modes of cell death resistance, uh, as we termed them. And I'm not going to be able to go through that all, but one of the key things, no matter how we define the um, mode of cell death resistance was the fact that the cell, uh, sorry, the protein translation rate always tended to be very high. So if there was some way, apologies, yeah, if there was some way of um, inhibiting or targeting that translation rate of MGMT, this might be a viable way of overcoming this phenotypic selection or this kind of methylation downshift. Uh, right, so let me just, apologies, I've, yeah, kind of spent too long at the beginning of the talk, not enough time at the end. Anyway, cell death resistance in GBM could be due to phenotypic selection, methylation downshift, or a combination of both, and there are many efforts underway to devise strategies to suppress MGMT levels to make GBM cells more sensitive to TMZ. Um, and our models from our huge explorations of the parameter space which was made feasible by this fixed population approach, um, we found that the translation inhibition would be an effective strategy to pursue. 
And actually some recent studies by a Chinese group, which I haven't referenced here, I've referenced my paper instead. I can share this paper with everyone if they're interested. They've shown that there's some microRNA that's expressed in our cells, which may be possible to overexpress in cells, and that can directly target MGMT by effectively inhibiting, and, it, and it, the end result is it inhibits this translation of MGMT mRNA. And in patients who were expressing this microRNA a little bit higher and where they found in this, I think it's the Chinese, somebody help me here, the CGGA, it's the Chinese, um, it's a massive collection of patients is anyone familiar? Is anyone familiar with the TCGA? Yeah. yeah, well, there's a Chinese equivalent of that, and I apologize for not remembering uh, exactly. What, I'm going to have to look that up later and maybe tell everyone later. But they found that patients that were expressing this microRNA a little bit higher would tend to live a bit longer because so, um, more suppression of this MGMT mRNA. Um, sorry. Resisting cell death is a challenge of hallmark of cancer to overcome. Over 50% of TBM patients develop resistance to TMZ therapy. Uh, Phenotypic expression of MGMT and a downshift in the methylation status of the MGMT promoter could provide time for dangerous mutations to accumulate. And the literature is a little bit confused about what happens with MGMT expression promoter methylation following TMZ treatment. I think I mentioned that at the beginning. Um, just from some burger, some experimental paper, they found basically that there's a significant interaction between MGMT protein expression and TMZ therapy. So I think there was this positive link between the level of MGMT protein, protein expression and the effectiveness of the TMZ therapy. But they found that the pro promoter methylation status didn't seem, seem to play a role. And then there are other papers that say the opposite thing experimentally with um, you know, these small sample size kind of studies in mice. And I think mathematical models can help elucidate these apparent contradictions. So, you know, the underlying mechanistic model could be correct. It's just we're in different regions of the parameter space. Um, so I, as I think I said from the beginning, you know, I think we should iteratively increase model complexity in line with the available experimental data. Um, maintaining computational efficiency enables things like Bayesian inference. And I just want to end with a few questions to the group, but I think Thomas already, I knew these slides before Thomas's talk and I wouldn't have included these questions otherwise. Um, I was thinking, you know, how does resisting cell death interplay with the other hallmarks of cancer? And anyone had any thoughts on that? Or could our models reveal unexpected connections between these hallmarks that are not immediately obvious? And yeah, one of the main things that I'm interested in is how these models might be able to suggest targeted treatments that might not be immediately obvious from just looking at the data. And yeah, thank you all for your time. And thanks all for the questions. Yes.